I'm John Walsh, and tonight on America's Most Wanted, you're gonna meet a woman who's gonna tell you her story. Ah, Rape strangled and then set on fire by two attackers. She fooled them by playing dead, suffering through the pain as they watched her burn. How she managed to do that, I don't know, but she's gonna tell you in her own words. Tonight, we gotta get her justice, so get ready because the manhunt starts right now. The manhunt for November 13th is now in progress. To date, you have captured 814 fugitives. Now, join the manhunt with John Walsh. What do you think of this one? Green Bay, Wisconsin. A single mom, we'll call Tammy, was getting ready for a night out and getting an earful from her daughters. Boring. No, too old-fashioned. It was August 19, 2003, and Tammy was on her way to meet some friends at a bar called Excess. Got it. I was in the bar, and I wanted to leave, so I went outside, walked out to the parking lot, realized that I had forgotten my keys, was going to go back into the bar. That's when I heard a voice say something to me. Hey, baby, you want to party with us? No, thanks. I got friends inside. Oh, come on, baby. We're more friendly. Come on, baby. Come on. Christ, God, me. I was kicking, screaming, uh, yelling for help. I even looked back out the window hoping that somebody was following, you know, somebody was doing something and there was nobody there. What are you doing? Help me! Help me! I was kicking. That's about the only opportunity that I had to fight back. Let me go, had choked me to the point where I, I had um, blacked out. The next thing I remember was the driver standing above me, raping me. I was feeling scared beyond belief. I was feeling degraded, sick to my stomach. I really thought that I was going to die. I remember gasping for air. Hey, she's out. What do you want to do? <laughs> I heard them laughing. I knew I was on fire. You could smell flesh burning. They knew that if I moved, that they would definitely kill me then. Imagine doused in lighter fluid, set on fire, your skin burning. Yet, in order to live, you have to play dead. I waited till they left to roll in and get the fire out. Now alone with burns covering her body, how would Tammy survive? I'd crawl and inch myself along. I tried to get up several times and kept falling. And I kept telling myself, I have to see my kids. I have, my kids can't live without me. My kids were my drive to keep going. And after that, I was able to finally get on my feet and proceed to follow the light and go to this house. I got really cold, saying, I'm cold, I'm cold. My body was burnt 61%, mixture of second and third degree burns. I had respiratory failure. It was very severe. It was almost a waiting game to see if I was going to survive. The victim was able to provide us with detailed descriptions with what she went through and to be able to give the complete description she gave of these two individuals and the truck and what happened that night is, is amazing. The next morning on a dairy farm just outside of Green Bay, two farm workers, Gregorio Morales and Juan Nieto, 
were about to get in trouble with their boss. Hey, Nieto, Morales. You both clocked in four hours late. This better not become a habit. I'm sorry, it was a long night. It won't happen again. All right, get back to work. The boss, Richard Binish, wouldn't have thought much more about the two men coming in late, except for what he saw on the news. They say the men brought her out to this field. I was shocked. My arms just had goosebumps on them. They, they were talking about Hispanic, two Hispanic people, and then it was close to the dairies. I had talked to my wife and decided that I couldn't really accuse anybody of anything until I had a little bit more to go on. Richard would get more to go on when he checked the local Fox station's website and saw two composites created from Tammy's description. Richard's gut told him those sketches were sketches of Morales and Nieto. He decided then and there, if his workers were guilty, he was going to get the goods on them. I posted the picture in the break room. It was just a horrible feeling thinking that I might know somebody or even employ somebody that had that could do something that horrific. Hey, Morales. This guy looks just like you. The very next morning, Gregorio came to work with his goatee and his mustache shaved clean off. Their names are Gregorio Morales and Juan Nieto. And I kept on calling the detectives and I gave them information all along and knew that it was the right thing to do. So far, police had no hard evidence linking either Morales or Nieto to the horrible crime. As they tried to make a case, the investigation was dealt a severe blow. Both men left town. But a few months later, Morales returned looking for work. That's when Richard Binish came up with a clever plan to figure out if Morales was responsible for the horrible crime. Well, you know... I did not need an employee at the time, but I needed to know for myself that if it was him that committed this crime, so I made room for him in the dairy. That was step one. Richard then secretly spoke to the detectives to determine what step two would be. I had asked them a couple different times if DNA would be at all what they needed, and they, they said they couldn't really ask Morales for his DNA. So I just waited until the right time came, and, and I tried playing a little bit of detectives. You want one? No, no, thank you. I'll stop smoking. You sure? I actually bought a pack of cigarettes for him, thinking I could get the DNA off that, but he, didn't, he wouldn't have one. But soon the perfect opportunity would present itself. Hey, it's good to be back. Thanks. You don't have to thank me. Just, just do a good job. Okay, I'll see you. I'll see you out there. I watch CSI Miami, so I know you can get DNA off of a soda bottle. And I bought another soda, and I just poured some out, and I put that one on the table just in case he'd walk back. In regards to Dick Benish, there's not enough that can be said about that guy. If anyone in my eyes is a hero, he is. Morales' DNA was lifted off the top of the bottle. It was analyzed and proved to be a perfect match to the DNA left at the crime scene. However, in the time it had taken to get that result, Morales had left Green Bay again. Richard had made it a point to have Morales check in with him when he settled down again. So when Morales found work at a dairy farm in Dexter, New Mexico, Richard relayed that information to detectives. Yeah. Morales was soon in custody. You expect me to remember something that happened that long ago? August 19th? That's my wife's birthday. I was home with her. I wasn't there. During this statement, Mr. Morales repeatedly denied any involvement in this. You know, it's funny, because we have your DNA on the soda bottle. And your DNA matches up exactly with the DNA that was found inside the victim. Now, do you want to explain that? It was at this time that he agreed to give us a full statement as to what happened in the events of that evening. What they did to this young woman is unconscionable, and I don't hold any remorse for what he's going to face in his life. And I hope he has a long, hard life. And so do I. As for Juan Nieto, he's still out there. Here's the only photo we have of him. Cops say Nieto is family in northern Georgia and might be working at another dairy farm. 
If you know where Juan Nieto is, call our hotline at 1-800-CRIME-TV. That's one very strong and very courageous woman. And her case doesn't end in Green Bay. Police believe they've made a connection right here, 1,300 miles away in Las Cruces, New Mexico. And we'll tell you about that when we come back, so stay with us. Coming up. This is where it all went down. John Walsh goes on the hunt for a college student's killer. Can you show me where they found her? 